Chapter 12, Trouble with Authority. What was left of the morning passed uneventfully. Armour even got in a few sums done. By the time the first whiffs of school lunch were beginning, the flood of the classrooms, Armour was congratulating himself on a stroke of genius putting the two little men together. There had not been another peep out of either of them. When Armour took an opportunity, which the teacher's back was turned, to open his pocket stealthily and peer down into it, he was pleased to see them sitting in the bottom of it, face to face, apparently having a conversation. For they're both gesticulating with their arms. It was too much noise for all around Omri to be able to hear their tiny voices. He had given them some thought on the matter to their lunch. He would separate them for that, one to each pocket, and slip some dry bits of food down to them. Omri let himself play with the wonderful fantasy of what the other kids' reaction would be if he casually brought them out and sat them on the edge of the plate. Funny to think that he would certainly have done it only a week ago without thinking about the dangers. The bell rang at last. There was a usual stampede and Omri found himself in the line next to Patrick. Come on then, hand them over, Patrick whispered over his tray as they shuffled forward to the fragrant food slots. Not now, everyone see. You said at lunchtime, after lunch. Now, I want to feed them. Well, you can have Boone, but I want to feed Little Bear. You said I could have them both, Patrick said no longer in a whisper. The others in the line turned their heads. Will you shut up, hissed Omri. No, said Patrick in a loud, clear voice. He held out his hand. Omri felt trapped and furious. He looked into Patrick's eyes and saw what happens to be the nicest people when they are sometimes bad and determined to get it. Come what may. Omri slammed his empty tray down on the floor and taking Patrick by the wrist, pulled him out of the line into a quiet corner of the hall. Listen to me, Omri grated out between his clenched teeth and anger. If you let anything happen to Little Bear, I will bash you so hard your teeth will fall out. This, of course, was what happened to the nicest people when they were in a trap. That he groped in his pocket and brought out the two little men out. He didn't look at them to say goodbye to them. He just put them carefully in Patrick's hand and walked away. Omri had lost his appetite, so he didn't get back in line, but Patrick did. He even pushed a bit. He was getting so eager to get some food to give out to the cowboy and to the Indian. Omri watched him from a distance. He wished now he had been too angry to give Patrick some pretty clear instructions, like telling him to separate them. Now he thought about it, perhaps it wasn't a good idea to feed them in the pocket. Who wants to eat something that's descended between two layers of cloth and collected bits of dust and fluff? He still had them. We would have taken them to some private place, taken them out to eat properly. Why had he ever brought them to school at all? The danger was so awful. Watching, he suddenly stiffened. Patrick had reached into the food slot now and received his dinner. He almost ran with it to a table. He did try to go to one of the outside rows near the windows, but a lunch lady stopped him and made him sit in the middle of the hall. There were children all around him and they on either side. Surely, thought Omri, surely he wasn't going to try to feed them there. He saw Patrick take a pinch of bread and slip into his pocket. He wasn't wearing a jacket. The men were in his jeans pocket. Fortunately, the jeans were now new and loose, but he still had to half stand up to get the bit of bread in. When he was sitting down, the people in his pocket must pretty well be squashed against his legs. Omri imagined them trying to eat, held down flat by two thick layers of cloth. He could almost see Patrick imagining it too. He was frowning uneasily and shifting around in his chair. The girl next to him spoke to him. She was probably telling him not to wiggle. Patrick said something sharp in reply. Omri sucked in his breath. If only Patrick wouldn't draw attention to himself. Suddenly he gasped. The girl didn't even give Patrick a hard push. He pushed back. She nearly went off her chair. She stood up and pushed him with all her might, using both hands. He went flying over backwards, half onto the boy on the other side of him, who jumped from his plate, spilling part of his dinner. Patrick landed on the floor. Omri didn't stop to think. He raced towards him in the hall, dodging in and out among the tables. His heart was hammering with terror. Patrick had fallen on them. Omri had a terrible, fleeting vision of pocket Patrick's jeans with blood stains spreading. He clamped down on his imagination. By the time he got there, Patrick was back on his feet. Now the other boy was angry and clearly looking for a fight. The girl on the other side was ready to clobber him too. Omri pushed between them, but a stout lunch lady was ahead of him. Air, air, what's going on? She said, barging with her big stomach and sturdy arms. She grabbed Patrick with one of her hand and the other boy with the other, and they kind of dangled them at arm's length with a pair of cats. No fighting in here. Thank you very much. It'll be off to the Edmaster office before you can say knife and the old blooming pack of you. She dumped them down in separate chairs as if they'd been bags of shopping. They were both thoroughly tossed at a red face. Armour's eyes shot down to Patrick's thigh. No blood. No movement either, but at least no blood. Everybody in to eat again, and the stout lunch lady stamped away, tutting as she went. Omri leaned over the back of Patrick's chair and whispered out of a dry mouth. Okay, all right. How do I know? said Patrick sulkily. 
His hand crept down delicately to explore the slight bump on the top of his leg where the pocket was. Armory held his breath. Yeah, they're okay. They're moving, Patrick muttered. Armory went out into the playground. He felt too jumpy to stay indoors or eat or anything. How would he get them back from Patrick, who quite obviously was not a fit person to charge of them? Nice as he was, as a friend, he wasn't. He just wasn't fit. Must be because he didn't take them seriously yet. He simply didn't seem to realize they were people. When the bell rang, Omri still hadn't come to any decision. He hurried back into school. Patrick was nowhere to be seen. Omri looked around for him frantically. Maybe he'd gone to the toilet to be private and give the men something to eat. Omri went in there and called softly, but there was no answer. He returned to his place in the classroom. There was no sign of Patrick. And there continued to be no sign of him until about halfway through the lesson. That a one, a one word which Omri took in. He was so worried. At last, the teacher turned her back to write on the board. Patrick slipped around the parishion, rushed into the room silently, and dropped in his chair. Where have you been? asked Armin in his breath. The music room, said Patrick smugly. The music room was not a room at all, but a little alcove of the gym where the music instruments are stored, together with some of the bulkier apparatuses in the long floor. Sat under the horse and fed them, he muttered, out of the side of his mouth. Only they weren't very hungry. I bet they weren't, Armin said, after they'd been through all they threw. Cowboys and Indians are used to rough treatment, Patrick retorted. Anyway, left some food in my pocket for them later if they want it. And it got all squishy. Oh, so what? Don't fuss so much. If you, they don't mind. How do you know they don't what they mind? Armory said hotly, forgetting to whisper. The teacher turned around. Oh, ho, so there you are, Patrick. And where have you been, may I inquire? Sorry, Miss Hilton. I didn't ask if you were sorry. I asked where you've been. Patrick coughed and lowered his head. In the toilet, he mumbled. For nearly 20 minutes? I don't believe you. Are you telling me the truth? Patrick mumbled something. Patrick, answer me or I'll send you to the headmaster. This is the ultimate threat. The headmaster are very fierce and can make you feel about two inches high. Patrick said, I was in the music room and that's true. I forgot the time. Well, that's not true, added Armin silently. Miss Hilton was nobody's school and she knew it too. You better go and see Mr. Johnson, she said. Armin, you go too, chatting away there as usual. Tell him I said you're both disturbing the class and I'm extremely tired of it. They got up silently and walked to the tables while the girls giggled, the boys smirked, and looked sorry for them, according to whether they liked them or not. Army glanced at Patrick under his eyebrows. They were in for it now. Outside the headmaster's office, they stopped. You not, whispered Patrick. No, you, retorted Patrick. They did it around for a few minutes, but it was useless to put it off, so in the end, they both knocked together. Yes, came a rather irritable voice inside. They edged around the door. Mr. Johnson was seated at his large desk, working on some papers. He looked up at one. Well, you two, what is it this time? Fighting in the playground or talking in class? Talking, they said. Patrick added, and I was late. Why? I just was. I don't waste my time, snapped Mr. Johnson. There must have been a reason. I was in the music room and I forgot the time, Patrick repeated. I don't remember you being especially musical. What were you doing in the music room? Playing. Which instrument? Asked Mr. Johnson with a touch of sarcasm. Just playing. With what? Said Ray's voice. With, uh, with, he glanced at Armory. He threw a warning grimace. What are you pulling faces about, Armory? You look as if someone just stuck a knife into you. Armory started to giggle, and that set Patrick off. Somebody just did, spluttered Patrick. Mr. Johnson was no such jolly mood, however. He was scowling horribly. What are you talking about, you silly boy? Stop that idiotic noise. Patrick's giggles were getting worse. If they hadn't been where they were, Armory thought Patrick would have folded up completely. Someone did stick a knife into him. Pick up Patrick, and he got it. A very small one. His voice went off into sort of a whinny. I mean, stopped giggling and was staring awful anticipation at Patrick. Patrick got into the state he was apt to do and say anything, like someone who's drunk. I mean, took a hold of his arm and gave it a sharp shake. Shut up, he hissed. Mr. Johnson got up slowly and came around his desk. Both boys fell back a step, and Patrick didn't stop giggling. On the contrary, it got worse. He seemed to be getting completely helpless. Mr. Johnson loomed over him and took him by the shoulder. Listen here, my lad, he said in a fearsome tone. I want you to pull yourself together at this moment and tell me what you meant. There's a child in the school who so far forgets himself to stick knives into people, even pretend to. I want to know about it. Now, who is it? Little bear, squeak, Patrick squeaked out. Tears were running down his cheeks. Armory cast, don't. Who? Asked Mr. Johnson, puddled. Patrick didn't answer. He couldn't. He was now speechless with nervous and almost hysterical laughter. Mr. Johnson gave him a shake of his own that rocked him back and forth on his feet like those weighted dolls that won't fall down. Then abruptly let go and strode back to his desk. You seem to be quite beyond yourself, he said sharply. I think the only thing I can do is telephone your father. 
Patrick stopped laughing instantly. Oh, that's better, said Mr. Johnson. Now, who did you say stabbed Omri? Patrick was rigid, like a soldier at attention. He didn't look at Omri, he just stared straight at Mr. Johnson. I want the truth, Patrick, and I want it now. Little bear, said Patrick very clearly and much louder than necessary. Little who? Bear. Mr. Johnson looked blank, as well he might. Is that somebody's nickname, or is that your idea of a joke? Patrick gave his head in one stiff shake. Armin was staring at him as if paralyzed. Was he going to tell? He knew Patrick was afraid of his father. Patrick, I shall ask you once more, who is this little bear? Patrick opened his mouth. Armin clenched his teeth. He was helpless. Patrick said, he's an Indian. A what? asked Mr. Johnson. His voice was very quiet now. He didn't sound annoyed anymore. An Indian? Mr. Johnson looked at him steadily for some seconds, chin resting on his hand. You're too old to tell these sort of lies, he said quietly. It's not a lie, Patrick shouted suddenly, making both Omri and Mr. Johnson jump. It's not a lie, he's a real live American Indian. To Omri's utter horror, saw Patrick was beginning to cry. Mr. Johnson saw it too. He was not an unkind man. No hassmaster is much good if he can scare the wits out of children when necessary. So Mr. Johnson did not enjoy making them cry. Now, Patrick, none of that, he said gruffly. But Patrick misunderstood. He thought he was saying he didn't believe him. He now said the words Omri been dreading most. It's true and I can prove it. His hand went to his pocket. Omri did the only thing possible. He jumped at him and knocked him over. He sat on his chest and pinned his hands to the ground. You dare, you dare, you dare, he ground out between the clenched teeth before Mr. Johnson managed to drag him off. Get out of the room, he roared. I won't, Omri choked out. He'd been crying himself in the minute he felt so desperate. Out! Omri felt his collar seat. So almost he hiked to his feet. Next thing he knew, he was outside the door hearing the key turning. That stopped me to think. Omri hurled himself against the door, kicking and banging with his fist. Don't show him, Patrick! Don't show him! Patrick, I'll kill you if you show him! He screamed at the top of his lungs. Footsteps came running. Through his tears, a sort of red haze. He saw Mrs. Hunt, the headmaster's elderly secretary, bearing down on him. She got a couple more good kicks and shots before she got a hold of him with both arms around his waist, carrying him, shrieking and struggling, bodily to their own little office. The minute she put him down to try to bolt, and he hung, she hung on. Omri, Omri, stop it. Calm down. Whatever's come over you, naughty boy. Please don't let him. Go in and stop him, Omri cried. Who? What? Before Omri could explain the sounds of footsteps in the next room, silently Mr. Johnson appeared, holding Patrick by the elbow. Headmaster's face was dead white. His mouth was partly open. Patrick's head hung down and his shoulders were heaving with sobs. When look at them told that Omri the worst, Patrick had shown them.